As I did a live stream of this tour, but it was a little bit choppy. So today I am on board the Torsk. I'm going to insert a little bit of footage here of the outside of the boat. And you can go back and watch the live stream I did if you were interested in that. But this might be a little bit better quality video. We'll do a quick run through of the boat, try and get some good shots, and uh, enjoy our visit of the USS Torsk submarine. Let's head below decks. Here we are in the aft torpedo room. We got a Mark 27 Mod 4 torpedo here, ready to be loaded into the tubes. Launched out of the aft of the boat, or the stern, or the back of the boat, for all of you land lovers. Pretty amazing to see these torpedoes. See they had bunks up here for the sailors, because space is such a premium on board a submarine. Pretty amazing space. Here's a glimpse inside of the torpedo tube. That's what it looked like to be launched out of a submarine. They'd load you in there. Be a pretty nerve-wracking uh, process, I would imagine. Getting this torpedo from here into there would be pretty scary stuff. Amazing all the technology that was involved in these ships. Um, this is a World War II submarine and it is just amazing to think of the sacrifices that these soldiers made to their comfort to their families and for their country for us to have their freedom pretty amazing look at this little bathroom back here or head as we called it not a lot of room and not a lot of privacy on these boats very low overhead and a high step to get through here these were watertight hatches these would close down seal down tight in case the hull of the boat was compromised these latches and spinning seals combined with this rubber gasket around the outside of the door would allow this to lock down tight and if they flooded in the back of the boat the water would not reach this compartment and similarly, there's another watertight hatch here and another beyond that. And in each compartment, there's a watertight hatch so that if one flooded, the rest of the boat would survive. This is the maneuvering room. This is the room that was responsible for um, raising the boat, lowering the boat, turning the boat left to right. As you can see, there are all sorts of handles, a stern, battery bus, slow, off ahead so these were the ways that you controlled moving the ship port reverser generator battery here we'll have the starboard side uh, components a stern a head see starboard reverser so that would the starboard side of the boat is the right hand side of the boat over here and the left hand side of the boat is the port side of the boat. So these are the controls that would control left and right turning. And here's kind of a diagram that explains it all. It would be a really long video if I went through and read it all. Um, but there is a whole plethora of knobs, switches, dials, Everything you would ever want to control a submarine contained within these rooms. Let's keep moving. We got uh, several other ships we're going to look at today. So, air to maneuvering room. Air to aft ma machinery compartment. So this is how you could allow air in or out once these watertight seals were locked down. If you had to purge that room. You could do that, I believe, with these valves right here. Alright, now we're in the uh, main room, or the engine room. These are Morse diesel engines. This is what powered this submarine. Um, pretty amazing feats of technology in and of themselves for the time. A 
very powerful machine. Um, this is an opposed piston engine and it means that each cylinder has two pistons and the lower crankshaft produced 78% of the total engine power and the upper half was used to drive the DC generators which ran the lights and air blowers other things like that and they would pull air from the engine or pull air for combustion from the engine room itself so air entered the engine room through pipes from induction valves and when the valve or when the submarine was submerged air intake valves and exa exhausts were closed off and you can see there's a uh, large wheel seen above the forward ends of the engine here that would shut off or open the air coming in to the engines. So after 1952, the air came in through a snorkel system while they were submerged kind of shallowly. But while they were underwater, they had to draw air from the engine room itself. So kind of a challenge that they faced. The aft engine room, pretty neat back here. Again, so many dials, knobs, buttons. Really hard for the bird dog to resist. Here you can kind of see the below space in the submarine. You really don't want to be working down there. You think it's tied up here. All right, let's move on through. Now we have the, uh, we're moving into the forward engine compartment. And again, we have more of these large engines, the forward engine room. There's these air scrubbers right here that would filter air. And again, we have the uh, stop valve, which would take in air from the surface. So many valves. When I was in the Coast Guard and on board the Coast Guard Cutter, part of our qualifications training was to learn all of the pipes, valves, um, mechanical fittings, things like that throughout the ship. And I just could not imagine having to do that on board a ship like this. Truly amazing, the knowledge and the skill um, that our service members have that, that so many people don't understand. The distilling unit. This would make fresh water by distilling seawater. It filled four 1,000 gallon fresh water tanks for crew use. Four smaller battery water tanks located in each battery well. Pretty neat. It was a process developed to, to make fresh water out of salt water on board these submarines when they were out at sea for a long time because space was so limited that they were not able to carry a large enough supply of fresh water for the long trips they were making during World War II and, and beyond. Well, let's keep moving. Now we're moving into sort of the living spaces of the submarine. Here we have a cruise washroom or a head. Um, the toilets were inside these locked areas here which they've got sealed up. Got a little sink here. That's about it. Poison antidote locker just in case. Here we have uh, a couple more heads or toilets down in here. It looks like they haven't been clean since World War II. But you'll have that on these big jobs. Here's a bunk room for the majority of the crew. Um, looks like we got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Can you imagine being on a boat with this many men? This is the amount of space each sailor had allotted to him to store his personal belongings. It went right under your bunk. It was very much like this on my Coast Guard cutter. Each one of these would lift up and you would have your storage space there. Again, not a, a whole terrible lot of room. Those fans were probably very luxury item. medical supplies in here got him a carton of Pall Malls could you imagine all the crew smoking in here when uh, 
you were under attack from a ship on the surface dropping depth mines or some depth charges or something, aren't you? Be scary stuff. Let's keep moving. They have these red lights on board um, to preserve your night vision. White light really messes with your night vision. Red lights will uh, keep it pretty stable. Here's the cruise mess. They had plenty of room in here. This is probably the most wide open space on the boat. This is where they would come to relax a little bit. There's a hatch that goes up. Just in case you need a little fresh air. The sinks. Garbage disposal unit. I suppose this would jettison the trash right out into the ocean. The garbage. Pretty neat. You had valves you had to know how to operate to be able to jettison the trash. This is where they did all the cooking for the crew. Had them a mixing bowl, hot plates, griddles. Pretty cool stuff. We'll move on now and into the bridge area. Here we have what looks to be the communications room, the radio room how they would communicate. Lots of tube operated systems in here back for World War II I would imagine. And now we're moving into the actual bridge itself. You see all these brass fittings and spinny things, knobs and buttons. This is a steampunkers paradise I would say. And here's the bridge. This is where the officers were at. Where they made all the executive decisions. The two steering wheels are here on the port side of the boat, which is a little odd to me. I would think they would be facing straight forward, but here they are on the port side. I would also have thought there would have been a chair here so you could sit and steer the boat, but you had to stand and steer. It's pretty neat. the emergency change valve how would you run the power you can see your depth rise and dive angle pretty neat forward brimming tank the ballasts safety tanks so much to keep up with on here See there's another berthing area down below. Here's an oxygen breathing apparatus or an OBA. These are a nightmare. I've had to use these on board a ship during fire. This is the OBA canister. This uh, You would punch this into the OBA unit on your chest. It would make break a seal right here and the chemical reaction would create oxygen. You'd have about 15 minutes worth of oxygen to breathe. It was very hard to breathe through those. You had to physically suck air in. The periscope itself is actually up in the conning tower, um, which we do not have access to. You can sort of see it up there, and uh, there were more officers and such up there. They would call down, signal to each other. Pretty neat. The compass. And now we move into the officers' staterooms. They were forward. Here we have the yeoman's office. He was the administrative uh, officer on board the boat. He did all the clerical work. Chief petty officer's birthing area. There were five chief petty officers berthed in this small area here. Pretty neat, had a little fold up sink and a safe. They probably kept some of the important documents and tools in with the chiefs. 
the officer's stateroom. This is where the executive officer and the higher lieutenant commanders, things like that, would have been berthed. They had a little desk area, three bunks. Here's the big money room, the captain's stateroom. You can see even he had very limited space on board this boat. Had a desk, his bunk, communications to the bridge, a little fold-up sink, private closet area there. We'll keep moving forward. Here's the officer's wardroom or the officer's mess. The officers would be served in here, eat their dinners, make big decisions as to what to do with the boat. Here's the junior officer's stateroom. There was four junior officers on board the boat. And again, they had a very limited amount of space, cubby holes to keep their gear. Pretty neat. That's where they would cook for the officers. And now we're moving into the forward torpedo room. Here's the sonar shack where they would keep track of other vessels' movements. And again, the red light to preserve your night vision. These guys were looking at sensitive instruments and they needed very good uh, hearing and eyesight to be able to keep up with these things. So that's where they would get their radar information. Here's another fold up sink. These drop down, fold it up. Pretty neat little contraption. Still seaworthy. And the forward torpedo room. We have Mark 37 Mod 2 torpedoes and Mark 14 torpedoes on the bottom. And again, bunks above the torpedoes. Imagine sleeping above the torpedoes at night. That's just how limited the space was. Look at this poor guy's bunk up here. He had to sleep with all these pipes. Submarine life was a tough life, I would say. It's a hatch going up. Escape trunk loop valve. And these are the forward or bow torpedo launchers. It would be so scary to be pushing this thing, this torpedo, up that ramp towards that and launching it. That is a don't drop the ball situation for sure. Look, they got little bunnies painted on uh, the launch tubes over there. I don't know if you guys can see that. It's pretty amazing to see how these uh, sailors lived, fought, and defended our country. It, uh, it's humbling to say the least, to think about the sacrifices that our soldiers and sailors continue to make to this day, um, risking their lives for our freedom. So I'm going to head back up to the top deck here, try not to hit my head on the overhead, try not to be that tourist who's fallen off of a ship with a cell phone. Here's the conning tower, and this is going to be where the periscope is at. Pretty neat, there's actually glass windows there. I always wondered, could you look out the window of a submarine? But, evidently not, because this is a deck area for when you're on the surface. I guess they'd hang out in here when they were up on the surface and have a cool place to ride and probably smoke their cigarettes. And this is the con tower where the periscope was located at, which they don't give you access to. I might go rent one of those purple dragons and paddle myself back to Tennessee. Hope you guys enjoyed coming along on this tour of the USS Torch today. I'm going to continue on with some other warships, so stay tuned for those videos. And until next time, have a great day in the life.